maybe Heilbronn. So really, really cool. Um, thanks so much for um, tuning in. And uh, thanks, of course, especially uh, Joe Edelman for um, uh, taking the um, uh, BVG probably to join <laughs> us here in um, uh, the Berlin School, which is um, uh, as um, those who are interested probably know, it's still not launched yet. Um, we are joined by approximately 20 pisciners in our um, second live piscine here in Berlin. Um, uh, Berlin is due to be kicked off uh, officially on the 1st of December with the first cohort, the first 150 students starting on the 28th of November. So we're really excited to have you with us and um, experience uh, 42. So far, I think the, the feedback is quite positive. The, the magic seems to work also in Berlin, which is exciting. And uh, I'm quite sure we are also joined by uh, the event space in 42 Wolfsburg, Wolfsburg, our sister school over there. So the fireside chats are a format that we open to um, all of the 42 schools. So um, there is about um, 12,000 students, I think, in the moment. So while um, uh, it, uh, the, the live presence might not be um, uh, blasting. Um, I think there will be um, uh, many who join us later on and might get in touch and follow up and see what we are discussing and how values and the approach that um, you promote, Joe, might become um, part of our um, way of thinking of our mindset of stuff that we promote. Okay, so let me um, open my little notes. We agreed on um, a rough flow of uh, the day. And of course I should um, start by sharing that Joe and I met about five, six years ago. It's quite some time ago uh, when I was still at Google and looking at um, uh, how Google might improve um, their way of building software by thinking more about values and um, uh, we were somewhat successful at, at trying at least, which um, you know, is always the, the first step. Um, not everything you try will be successful, but you'll learn from it. And certainly Joe's work has uh, developed quite a bit since then. And I think it's gotten much more um, compelling and accessible because what um, he's doing, we will of course hear from him in a little what uh, that is exactly or how he thinks about it, but uh, is a, um, almost um, alchemistic process, right? Of bringing human values into technology, something very rigid um, and something very soft and uh, intangible that comes together. And um, I think the motivation that uh, you put forward is uh, first and foremost that the technology sh should serve us humans to live good lives and to um, uh, yeah, be productive, have meaning in, in our lives. All of which are topics that um, I admit are very close and dear to me for many years as well. So I'm super happy you're here. Um, a little bit about Joe's background. Um, it all got started with um, thinking about how to create meaning-based organizational metrics at Couchsurfing. Couchsurfing is the much cooler Airbnb that existed before and uh, is still working not for profit. So if uh, you are on a budget and you want to travel around the world, check out that platform. You'll find wonderful people who offer you their couch. And uh, Joe basically figured out that in such a space, you want to get to the actual act of sleeping on somebody's couch as quick as possible and spend your time well. That was the um, motto, the slogan of the um, effort back then, time well spent as a metric. And um, I think that set you up on your journey um, to build um, the Center for Humane Technologies together with Tristan Harris, who um, stayed in the States and um, took more of an Anglo-Saxon way, I guess, of, of um, promoting those values. And you came to Berlin straight, or did you have some intermediate steps? Yeah, yeah. So Tristan and I, um, we sort of decided to split our effort with me working on what the solution was and him working on raising awareness of the problem. And then I got a small grant to work on that stuff. And I moved to Berlin to, to, to do that research. How long ago was that that you moved? That was six years ago, six, six, six and a half. Ah, so we must have met just when you yeah, arrived. Cool. Yeah. 
So um, Joe's background is in human computer interfaces, so UX kind of questions, and he's particularly cr critical actually of uh, many of the practices there, but as well in program language design and consulting and technology more broader. Um, there's more to say. I already spoke. I feel way too long. Um, we're here to um, hear mostly from you. So what did I miss? What um, uh, aspects would you like to add to that fairly general introduction? I guess I'll just say that um, I, I'm working. I, there's, I, I've sort of worked at a series of the, the problem is very complicated. <laughs> And the first thing that I figured out, which is about 2016, was about metrics. So I think the standard kinds of product success metrics that engineers use, like uh, monthly active users or whatever, are not ideal for creating things that are um, um, really good for people. Uh, so that, that work was called Time Well Spent, or the, the talk that I gave about it was called Is Anything Worth Maximizing? Um, and that was kind of like the first step. Then the next step uh, was design methods. Uh, so what kind of design method makes things better for people? <laughs> and then uh, more recently, I'm, I'm trying to move past design methods. I, still, I teach design methods and, and sort of business practices. Um, and I'm trying to move a level above uh, engaging with um, larger ecosystem dynamics, uh, tweaks to capitalism, um, tweaks to... Uh, the kinds of user profiles, recommender systems, uh, these kinds of things. So I'm kind of moving my way up a stack of how uh, a better technology ecosystem would look. Cool. So um, uh, let me interject one little point, and that is um, we've just discussed before this meeting that uh, we'd love to see how um, Joe's um, approach could come to 42, how we can make that accessible to you. And the textbook is already open source, so everybody who's um, interested can jump in. He's running his own um, school um, classes. To, to learn that and uh, Jan Bernbeck, who I believe is online, one of the pedagogy leads from Wolfsburg, uh, said he'd love to, to dig deeper with Joe. So if any or everything we uh, discuss here sounds uh, interesting and relevant for your lives, please get in touch as I'm sure we'll love prototypers and pilot um, students to test things out. Now, um, you've mentioned that something seems to be broken um, in the current system. And maybe we start with that analysis of yours to understand why you think uh, we need to change something and what is not working. Um, I got a recommendation from one of our staff members here to read about uh, post-capitalism in my um, uh, summer vacation. And I have to say, while I don't agree with all elements of the analysis, book is uh, Paul Mason, um, uh, Clear Bright Future, quite recommendable, at least in many, many bits of it. Uh, I think you're part of a general movement to try to get to a place where we're in a more sustainable and future-oriented and maybe humanist um, uh, way. So what's broken? And um, then we can slowly get into the different steps of uh, fixing it or how sure. you're proposing to contribute to a fix. Yeah, so the frame, some of you might've watched my, my talk, which I, I, almost everything I'm gonna say is going to be in that talk, so I, I hope I'm not, hope I'm not too boring. Um, but if you want to know more about anything I said, and you didn't watch the talk, you can go, you can go watch it later. Um, so the way I break it down is I say that there's different kinds of entrepreneurial projects or different kinds of design things, um, uh, and I break them down into funnels, tubes, and spaces. So a funnel is uh, a thing, an entrepreneurial project where you try to get everybody to do the same thing, where you try to ramp up one shared goal. Like uh, we wanna get as many malaria bed nets to as many people in Sub-Saharan Africa as possible. Let's drive that metric up and to the right. Um, a tube is something where each user comes with their own goal. So Google search would be a tube, Amazon search is a tube, um, Uber and so on. Uh, everybody comes to the same goal. You're trying to accelerate everybody's goals, everybody along to their same goal. And then a space is pretty much everything that's not a funnel or tube. So a space is all the stuff that you wouldn't accelerate. Um, uh, and capitalism, broadly speaking, and our current business practices, things like lean startup, things like um, UX design, they're really made for the funnels and the tubes and they're not made for the spaces. And there's, there's a 
problems, you know, many people want to make spaces and there are large scale spaces. So Minecraft, I think is a good example of a large scale space. Um, I think you say a festival, right? A place where you hang out and you just enjoy hanging out is a space. Maybe yeah. Maybe some other examples yeah. because I just think spaces are awesome. 42 should be a space. Yeah. Right? We're, we, we're thinking about right, the end goal of you mastering the software engineering, but being here is also a thing in itself, right? It should be fun. I hope so. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, there's many examples, uh, you know, your, your living room, uh, cafes and bars or whatever. And many of these things do uh, survive in the market somehow, often by attaching some kind of transaction that supports it. Like in a bar, you, you buy beer or whatever, right? And that kind of, but the bar is not really about maximizing beer sales, right? Like, if it was, they wouldn't actually make a bar. They'd make a stand or right, some other kind of structure, right? So clearly the entrepreneur who thinks, oh, I want to start a cafe and I want there to be like classes in the cafe and talks and I want it to be a good space for intellectuals or something like that. This person is not like, how can I maximize beer sales, right? But they probably do want to maximize something. Like there's something that they want their bar to be good for. We just don't tend to measure or um, monetize that thing um, and so that that puts a, that thing that the bar is actually for the cafe is for the festivals for the school the research lab the democratic community like a town hall or something all these things are spaces they, they're at a disadvantage can you please mute yourself in the online space and unmute yourself when you want to contribute something ideally after i haven't been invited to do so it's like having ghosts. It's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so spaces are at a disadvantage because they, uh, to, to kind of perform, well, for, for several reasons. One is that all the uh, business methodologies that people know are adapted to funnels and tubes and are bad for spaces. So often someone will want to make a space. That'll be their like kind of pitch or something. But then they apply UX design, incentive design. They apply something, some methodology, lean startup to it. And lo and behold, it becomes a funnel uh, because that's actually what those things are for, right? And so they lose their space idea, even if it was something that would be really valuable, because obviously many of these things are really valuable, um, the methods are just wrong. And then there's an additional problem, which is that uh, the, the, the market itself and also recommender systems and other kinds of large scale systems also make things a little bit harder for spaces. So even if you manage to find the methods to make a good space, you're still at a relative disadvantage. It, it, it can work. Um, there are lots of successful space businesses, um, but I think there's not as many as there should be. Cool. So um, I should take a quick second to say um, we, we're fire chatting, right? There is a fire, everything's here. But um, this is also a community event and we're very much inviting you to come in with questions. Uh, basically, happy to see you here in the room, raise your hand at any time and we'll try to squeeze it in and make it more of a conversation, right? So you don't have to wait till the end. Um, uh, Jonas can give me a signal when somebody online is raising their hand or if there's questions coming in um, over chat, which is usually the medium um, uh, more introvert people choose, um, uh, but I want to encourage everyone, especially the more, more introvert ones to use it as a chance to um, you know, break the pattern and get into the mode of um, participating in big community conversations because that's really helpful. Is the microphone working? Check, yes, it seems wow. to be on. That's on the fly. It was not working five minutes ago. Thanks, Jonas. Can you please uh, pass the mic to uh, All right. our so first just for our online audience, we will start with the question here in the auditorium and then I will move over to the chat and collect the questions there. Awesome. All the planning, you know, let's just have a good conversation. <laughs> it's uh, possible to make a mat matrix uh, like um, she and Fickle, she, she self, uh, like uh, our urge. Uh, so we make a matrix and we are put a pixel and the, the pixel um, tile, tile sich, uh, on more of them and puts created so, something. Uh, like uh, what, what what do like uh, the KI or on uh, AI on the matri matrix? Do you refer to planting a seed um, like his approach that then spreads? Yes. Is that the question? Maybe you could paraphrase it for me. I didn't really understand it. 
I, I guess, and you should confirm, the question is how to spread the approach, how to spread more value-based design. It, it's a possible, uh, like, so something. Well, so I think there's, there's, I'm trying to work at two levels. So um, one, it helps just if people identify as space makers, as a kind of subtype of entrepreneur, just like there's organic farmers um, or, right? If somebody says, okay, I'm actually doing this kind of entrepreneurship, not this other kind, I care about what happens for instance, here, <laughs> not just the end goal, not accelerating to the end goal or whatever, right? And I want to use special design methods, special product success metrics um, that are well adapted to making a good space. Uh, as people start to identify this, then a community forms and it can survive uh, and thrive um, in, in, as a kind of a niche um, and grow. And then there's another thing, which is, um, you know, larger interventions to make uh, this, these things go better to, to put these on a, on a more even footing, right? So, um, uh, I mean, the simplest thing would be subsidies, right? Like, I, I don't actually, this is not the direction that I go in, but um, Europe subsidizes already a lot of spaces. Germany subsidizes a lot of spaces, right? There's like a lot, there's, there's federal money for things like churches. Um, and we could generalize that. We could say, actually, we need community spaces. The churches aren't really cutting it. Um, but can we, you know, can we, can we somehow subsidize spaces, right? And then this, then we, if we already have a community of space makers that are making festivals and games and all these kinds of things, and there's subsidy money coming in, that would be one way. So I, anyway, I try to work at two levels. One is creating a community that does it and does it well. And another is creating, you know, ecosystem changes to support that community. Cool, so we jumped in a completely different direction um, than I thought we would be at this point. But um, now I cannot resist uh, to, to comment. I just um, came back to a, a concept, a, a term, and a, and a, and a thing that um, I thought about years ago. Do you know about the Wu Wei, which is the uh, philosophy of no, no intervention or of seeing something flow, right? The natural way of things developing and um, Basically, a, a Taoist insight is that you should not flow, uh, try to um, uh, go against the grain, right? You have to flow with the natural tendencies that are already there. This is not last why I made the comment earlier that I think the zeitgeist is ready for you, Joe. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. you know, 10 years ago, it wasn't as obvious and you saw it pretty early and you spent a lot of time preparing the vocabulary around it and making it accessible and able to, to spread like a meme, right? As an idea, someone was mentioning the history of ideas. I, I, I think, you know, this is a, a new idea and it's a, a, a powerful one, hopefully a healthy one that, um, you know, you, you described what you were looking for in terms of like cells dividing, right? Which is already a different language than something going viral, what you used to say before, right? So I think it's, it's really about growing a space for, for your ideas to flourish and to spread as well. Okay, do I understand correctly that there's also someone online um, who wants to come in? Yes, so uh, we have a question from Nick and Nick already said that he could unmute himself and ask the question via headset. Uh, feel free to start, Nick. Yes, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hi, Nick, uh, yes. where are you from? Okay. Uh, Copenhagen. Awesome, nice to hear you. Uh, yeah, like I'm not sure, like, you know, understand it completely, but I was curious about what is like a example of a successful space and like some of like um, what like were the essential moves that these successful space businesses did, you know, like the mechanisms that I'm guessing were used or, yeah. And maybe uh, if I may uh, narrow it down a bit more, do you have an example of a project that you worked with where you um, could describe how it was uh, applied? I think that might be helpful. Yeah, sure. Um, maybe I'll give a few examples quickly. Um, so two examples that I don't have anything to do with are uh, massively multiplayer games like, like Minecraft and Roblox. Um, uh, also, uh, there's a bunch of tools for exploratory thinking, things like uh, Rome, um, uh, other, I don't know if you guys know Andy Matuchak's work, he does, uh, uh, 
you know, ways of organizing your notes and space. There's a, there's a company here called Muse um, that also does this kind of stuff. So these are all, I think, spaces, um, good examples of spaces that are sort of out there and that are making it as a business. Um, one that I've worked with, um, maybe I'll give two examples. Um, Even.com and Hello World are two startups uh, that took my course. Um, Even.com is a financial tools um, uh, app. It's like a financial planning app. You, you can also get loans, uh, but it's designed to help people get out of poverty, um, mostly Americans. Uh, so there's about 10 million uh, lower income Americans that use this app and they get loans, but they also have this space for um, planning for their families. Uh, and in order to get a loan, you kind of have to make this plan about how are you going to spend the money? How is it going to put your family in a better place and so on? And this was designed using uh, the values-based social design method that I, that I teach um, uh, based around what, about, around the meaningful experiences of other people who got out of poverty. So that's uh, like about 10 million, 10 million people. Another one, Hello 10 world. million people yeah. are impacted by that. That's a good number. Yeah. Um, another one, Hello World, is uh, replacing college admissions and uh, grant applications. Schmidt Futures uses it. A bunch of other grant programs that you can apply for. And instead of applying for the grant through a form uh, as an individual, you get put in small teams and your teams work together. They decide what to do together. There's like a great freedom about what your teams will do. And uh, the whole process is instrumented so that um, the people that are really contributing well to their teams can are the ones that end up being selected for the grants or admitted to the university or whatever. So this is um, definitely a, a space design kind of approach to something that's usually a funnel. Um, and I think it's, it's really beautifully done. Um, and again, it's built out of what the meaningful experiences of people working in teams. Uh, yeah. Awesome. I really want to um, learn more about that approach because you know we also have to, to select people and um, uh, all, all insights are, are really useful. Um, maybe you can go one level deeper and uh, because now it's clear what the application is, but maybe rapid uh, run through the, how do you operationalize the, um, the metrics, right? How do you have the teams go through it? And as you can imagine, right? Describing that in five minutes is gonna be pretty difficult, but I'm sure you've done it before. But um, if you haven't understood each notch, don't worry, there's um, more materials to dig into. Sure. Um... So we teach a few different things. Um, uh, the first thing is that spaces have a different success criteria. So um, uh, generally, if you're making a funnel, the success criteria is very clear. It's like, oh, do people complete the funnel, right? Do we have bounce or churn or, right? Or do they actually get to the, <laughs> do, they get, do, they, do they go through the transaction, right? This is the, and if they're going through the transaction, you're winning, right? But you don't have something like that in a space. So you need a different uh, uh, way to imagine success. And I use these things that I call values or sources of meaning. So um, let's say you're making something where people are, are supposed to be creative. So I guess probably in this, in this uh, institution, people are hoping to be creative. <laughs> Right. So you, you want to design the, the roles and the responsibilities and the flows, and these, you know, everything about 42 <clears throat> to support people and being creative. How do you do that? Um, like, how do you know if they're being creative or not? I think the word creative doesn't quite cut it. Like you need, to, you need something a lot more uh, specific and measurable. And so what we do is we interview people about their most meaningful experiences of creativity and we write down um, uh, common characteristics about what they were paying attention to and how they were making choices when they were doing that creative thing, when they were experiencing this meaningful thing. Um, and it turns out that you can make it this, we make these little cards, these little sources of meaning cards that's like, that, that act as a kind of litmus test. Uh, the space is a good space for this kind of creativity if people are able to pay attention to these things and make these kinds of choices. Um, 
So that's kind of the first step is uh, training people to have this success criteria for spaces. Uh, and then there's all these questions about how to design a good space. And this involves some amount of deprogramming because a lot of my uh, students come, most of my students are professionals, a lot of them from big companies like Google and Twitter and Facebook and so on, um, a, a lot from startups. Uh, and they mostly have a background in something like UX or something like incentive design or just like typical product management. And they kind of need to forget a bunch of things or to be sort of talked out of or exercised out of a bunch of approaches that are um, you know, biased towards funnels and tubes, like I was saying before. So uh, for instance, uh, there's a visual way of prototyping like paper prototyping in UX. This is really great for um, individual experiences and funnels because you have like a series of boxes and you have like the, the users kind of going from one box to another and ending out on the other. But it's terrible for prototyping social things um, and for uh, prototyping things that are more like um, what people do in a container rather than how people move through a flow. So uh, this is hard for people because they have this tool that they've gotten very good at <laughs> and they're like, oh great, time to prototype. Like, and then it's, you know, it sends them in the wrong direction. So some of what we do is like remove that, um, uh, kind of tie their hands behind their back and say, okay, how are you gonna solve this without that? Um, and then some of what we do is, is, is give them new tools. Uh, we give a new type of prototyping. We also have a, a anthropological a kind of user research tool. It's kind of like our version of jobs to be done. It's more like values to be lived or something uh, where uh, you find out what's hard for somebody about living by one of their values. Um, where they managed to live by it, where they didn't manage to live by it, what are the differences? So this is like another user, kind of user research uh, method that ends, ends up leading to design ideas and spaces. So that's kind of like an overview of what we teach. Cool. Very quickly, just to confirm or for me to learn more and then probably everybody else, you define um, the value that you're um, designing for you do the design and then you ask the user um, kind of on a scale from one to 10, how much do you think this is um, implemented, possible, facilitated in the space? Is that uh, yeah, how the actual metrics part then works? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We make this card that captures how uh, we're designing the space for people to live. So it would specify a very particular kind of creativity. Maybe it's about like thinking really deeply and making your choices from, or maybe it's about, uh, uh, jamming and coming up with many ideas and brainstorming among peers or something. I don't know. You'd find a particular kind of creativity that you want to make sure is happening. Um, that's your kind of goal. And you specify it in this kind of document structure that you'll, you can see in my talk. And then you can just show people that and you can say, okay, were you able to live this way? And uh, it's pretty clear. Like they'll, they'll, they'll say, oh yeah, I, I did that here and it was really great. Or they'll say, no, not really like that. <laughs> Cool. Okay, we um, uh, we have two more uh, elements in um, uh, the the flow that I would love to get to, and then we can really open it up. One is um, when we have smart people who have um, uh, expertise in something. Obviously, we try to benefit as a forty two school, and as you can imagine. Um, uh, we are um, very dedicated to provide a space for people to learn as much as they can. And one of the values that we have defined that are really the one binding element, we wanna be as diverse as possible. In fact, one of the values is radical inclusion. I'd include everybody, but not fall into um, the, the popper dilemma. Um, he's basically defined that when you're so tolerant that you um, tolerate the intolerant, then your space is gonna be taken over and you have no distinction between you know, your space and the rest of the world. Um, so we, we have to um, also agree on rules and, and stuff like that. So we have a set of values that um, we put forward that we revise every now and then. We have all the students and um, candidates sign up to those values, kind of like terms of services, but one of the things is, are they really reading them, right? I mean, just like the terms of service didn't read um, approach. And um, I was wondering if there is anything that um, you could say, um, well, to those who actually make the space, right? And to those who are um, 
putting the infrastructure around it, what we should pay attention to um, that you'd recommend us to apply what um, your, your approach is essentially. Yeah, sure. Um, so two quick things that you can do. Um, uh, one thing is, so the word values is, or the way that people usually write values and what they mean by values is, is vague in a way that I try to be more specific um, and include some stuff that I exclude. Um, so, um, one thing that I exclude, uh, so some, I, I use a synonym for when I'm talking about values, a synonym that I use is sources of meaning. So, uh, things that are actually meaningful to live that way. So this is a subset of what people mean by values. Um, uh, for instance, um, equality wouldn't really be a value, um, uh, the way that I use the word values, right? <laughs> we call that an ideological commitment. We separate, we have a sort of taxonomy of these things that we, you know, in, in, in the school. So equality would be an ideological commitment. Inclusiveness might also be an ideological commitment. There's probably something meaningful about inclusiveness, right? People have experiences of inclusiveness that are like beautiful and meaningful for them. Maybe it's something about connecting with somebody with a very different background or viewpoint or something like that, right? Um, so you can take all of your values and you can look for these sources of meaning. And the sources of meaning are much more useful as a litmus test because are we being inclusive or exclusive? That's kind of like a matter of debate, but are people having this experience of connecting with people that are very different than them or whatever? That's like probably either happening or not happening, right? And that, that can reveal probably that one's happening. But often when you do this, when you go through these lists of abstract values and you turn them into sources of meaning, you're like, oh shit, <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, well, I mean, um, uh, for those in the room, um, uh, those who start in uh, November, you're welcome to do the next round of uh, revision because I don't think you know we've covered all the points. I'm quite happy. I'd love to show you, bribe you with a beer or two and, and show you the values as they are right now to see um, what you have there. Cool. Um, then the other bit is um, uh, your book recommendations for uh, those who are new to this format and to um, what we do at 42 Wolfsburg in Berlin is we try to find the best 1000 books each software engineer should read, especially if he, he or she wants to be a happy software engineer. So there is a good bunch about, you know, living a good life and um, uh, good habits and, and that. And then there is technical books or books uh, that are more uh, on the technology and on the um, academic side, I guess, that um, we're trying to find the ones that are still relevant in, you pick your number of years, but 20 years, 50 years, ideally, right? Not the uh, C++ in 20 days that's outdated when it gets out of the uh, printing press. And um, no surprise, Joe had uh, a couple of ideas to um, uh, recommend to, for us to include in the library. Do you want to um, uh, give us a, a short outline? Let's go one by one and give folks the uh, ability to ask a question or for me to come in as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so let me, I'll give it like a little preamble, which is, I, I see this thing happen to, so, you know, ignorance might make you happy in the short run. <laughs> But I see this thing happen to almost everybody in tech. I, I'm friends with the guys, for instance, who started Instagram. Um, and they're like, oh shit, we created a monster, right? And, and, and that's the true for so many of the founders I know. And then I also see a lot of young people, 20 somethings go work for some tech company. And at some point they're like, oh shit, I work for a monster, <laughs> right? And um, no one really knows how to stop it. I mean, I think my curriculum is like a, a start and how to, if you have, if you somehow have a position to actually start a project yourself, I think that um, maybe, maybe that's a situation where you can do better. Um, but in general, whether you're a founder or you're uh, just a worker in tech, people end up like, really crushed by the dystopian aspects of what they were part of making. Um, and so that's not a happy engineer, right? <laughs> yeah, create something that's meaningful and long lasting, really meaningful. Yeah. Seems like a good bet to happiness. Yeah, so, but unfortunately this is really hard. 
Um, but I think it's easier if you go in with more of this view to how things might go bad. Um, and so my, my, uh, my, my book recommendations are all about that. So the first one is um, uh, from the early 90s, uh, but still super, super relevant. So this is by Neil Postman, the same guy who wrote a more famous book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, which is kind of about, I don't know, television and TikTok and endless feeds and stuff like that, even before there were endless feeds. Um, but Technopoly is a much deeper book about, um, and a much deeper critique about the kind of society that we've been building really since the late 1800s. Um, so the book kind of starts with um, factories and quarterly reports within factories and pressure to scale up and surveillance and how, and Taylorism, you guys know Taylorism? <laughs> like, and it, it, the, the idea is that just the rollout of new technologies, things like smart cities, for instance, or um, internet of things or whatever, these things, like go bad in very predictable ways again and again and again. And people who advocate for smart cities or internet of things or something have all sorts of reliably, or you know, these days machine learning, have super reliably optimistic ideas about their social impact. But if you take a historical view and a sociological view and you look at the history of these kinds of rollouts, again and again and again, you've seen the same kind of dystopian stuff. And the impacts that, that the optimists were hoping for some of them happen, but also a lot of other really bad stuff happens. So let me challenge you a little bit on this, because uh -huh. um, I think that's uh, fairly the way that you describe it now is this um, you know, critical, somewhat leftist. We need to um, take more care about um, fairness and um, you know, not, not making mistakes. Now, someone who is more on the... Um, liberal side would say, well, but if we don't make mistakes, we can't learn, we're not moving forward. So um, is he um, in that middle ground or would you say he's a good one to know for the critique about um, progress and innovation or where- He's definitely where more on the space? critical side, but I, I think the deeper thing is that um, uh, Engineers and even designers, they don't think that they're social scientists or that they're doing social things. They think that they're just building some kind of neutral, you know, I don't know, some tool or something. They even like, they could say, I'm a tool maker or whatever, right? <laughs> I'm not responsible for how it's going to roll into the world. But, it, you know, that doesn't work. Like, uh, and we saw architecture and urban planning go through this phase. Or in like in the late 1800s, early 1900s, right? Where people were just like, I'm, I'm not designing society. I'm just making big buildings. Um, but but it's, it's not like that, right? Like you, you make a bunch of big buildings and there's no sun and there's no parks and you know there's a ghetto next door or whatever. And you're like, oh man, maybe I actually should have taken the social conditions into account. Maybe I'm not just like a neutral, you know, building maker or whatever, right? So and, maybe that's a nice segue to Alexander. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, think, I think this is um, something that architecture and urban planning learned uh, in the middle of the 20th century. And now we have beautiful cities like Berlin. Part of why Berlin is so cool is because it was built after, because <laughs> it was bombed and then rebuilt after some of these realizations. And it was rebuilt by urban planners who like took these social factors into, a, into account, right? And I think we're going through the same struggle right now in tech. Like, we need exactly the same kind of realization, which is that, sorry, guy, you think that you're just an engineer, but you need to take a bunch of social factors into account if you're gonna make something good. Um, sorry, <laughs> you're gonna have to learn some other stuff. Um, so we're there. And one of, the, one of the places we can learn from is, is architecture and urban planning. And one of the best books uh, on that is the third recommendation that I made, A Timeless Way of Building, which is, um, this guy, Christopher Alexander, he's an architect, famous architect's attempt to recapture what makes things like uh, old European cities so livable and what made like the American car-based cities so bad and um, how you can build in a good way. And I think many of the lessons from that book especially are also relevant for things like apps.
And what I didn't know is um, he actually did have an impact on software and uh, the way agile software development developed. And in particular, um, um, I forgot the first name, Cunningham, the guy who wrote the first wiki, mm. um, uh, directly referenced him as, as an inspiration and influence. So um, more directly relevant also to the history of software development, as you might think. And sorry, we, you did speak a little bit about the second one, but I don't think oh, yeah. you made it explicit yet. So um, yeah, so recommendation another was... long-term trend that's very relevant for engineers, especially if you're making any kind of social app, is Society of the Spec. So there's this book, Society of the Spectacle, which uh, is so amazingly prophetic. It's from the late 60s, or earlier 70s. But it captures like selfie culture, like um, Instagram anorexia, like all this kind of stuff super well. Somehow, you know, 30 years before, 40 years before any of it happened, <laughs> um, he, he's just a very good cultural critic. And he saw us heading that way with even, you know, that stage of television advertising. Um, and I think this is another thing that people often unwittingly participate in uh, without you know, it seems like, for instance, the founders of Tinder at first thought that they were doing a good thing, <laughs> right? But if they had read this book, they might have made a different app and we all might have a healthier relationships. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so uh, you, you definitely have triggered some questions. Um, and I, but don't you think the use of Twitter also really depends on, um, well, obviously the, the big saying in ethics of technology is technology is neither good nor bad nor neutral, right? It always depends on the use cases. And, you know, to some degree, when you said that about Twitter, I think- Oh, I meant Tinder. Did I say Twitter? Uh, sorry, no, 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 Tinder. Yeah. Uh, Tinder. I, uh, I thought, hang on, it's, it's about, you know, how people are using it not necessarily is that design already um so so oh it's so dark i don't know if you know so the dark? details no, um, I don't. so uh is it dark okay People only four percent of men on tinder actually ever have a date um uh the vast majority are berlin is a little better the numbers are a little better <laughs> um, the vast majority are just swiping um uh i mean to some extent it's actually porn pretending to be a dating app um, uh, the way that Tinder works is with this ELO scores. Does anybody know about the ELO scores? No? Um, so they, they, they try to measure how hot you are and show similarly, like, like so that there's sort of like two ways you can go. So if you're not hot and they don't think you're going to go on any dates, then they just show you hot people because that's going to keep you in the app. <laughs> Right, and it's going to keep you wishing that you uh, could like maybe have a date with one of these hot people. If you are hot, then you'll only see other people that are at this kind of similar hotness, right? Um, and they judge how hot you are by how many people swipe you that see your profile, right? Um, so this has got a kind of a view of what a good relationship is in it, hmm. right? And it's not a very optimistic view. <laughs> Okay, maybe I, uh, I was short-sighted here. Um, I, I guess I, I don't have to be ashamed to say that that, that happened after I found my wife. So um, I don't have that experience. But um, let's see, um, uh, any questions in the room directly? And when you do come in, please uh, state your name and uh, what, whatever else you want to uh, identify as or with. And I see there's also a question online. Do you want to take this one in first, if it was early? Yeah, there was a person waiting for quite a while. Um, it is Pitt, right? Uh, and um, I think... Yeah. So um, first of all, um, you have to excuse me for being a little bit slow on the uptake. I'm you know, a little bit um, uh, stupid because I do not fully understand this ter terminology. Uh, that you introduced of uh, spaces and funnels. Um, what, what 
purpose uh, does that serve other than giving new names to already existing um, concepts because you you do see, you do seem to be uh, keen on using some uh, you know synonym like redefining like spaces instead of businesses sources of meaning in, in instead of values um, so my question is can you give us some more uh, practical usage examples for those new names and divisions wait do, do you know other names for spaces funnels and tubes that are in previous use i, I don't yeah, know yeah but can you so can you please tell me again what the spaces actually are um because the they, they seem to be yeah entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial project or a thing that you're building that uh is not goal driven in the sense or it's not outcome driven in the sense that it's about kind of being there rather than something that you would accelerate so it's a business is it not but a business all, not driven by businesses. not driven by uh, monetary gain. No, no, no. They can be bit driven by monetary gain. It's so again, what's the difference between the space and the business? I think most of the people get it. I'm sorry. I, we can send you some reading afterwards. I'm um, disappointed. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Peter. Um, uh, we have two questions in the room, or is there more online? Jonas, you're you're the master of the microphone. You're. Uh, Let me check real quick uh, the chat. I know that Jan Bernbeck is online, and I'm sure he would love to come in if um, uh, you're looking online. We also have questions from Wolfsburg. Oh, very cool. Cool. Then I would say let's go to Wolfsburg, and then I see Nick having another question, and then we start with the question in Berlin. So Wolfsburg first. Well, the question is kind of related to the last one. We're trying to also really understand the, the whole distinction of spaces and the different models, but even a little more on a meta level in the sense that, of course, it was presented that there is these values that should be, could be optimized or maximized instead of traditional profit or other metrics, right? So maybe the, my particular question is, what's the, what kind of values are you proposing to be used. I mean, you of course mentioned the sources of meaning, but it, that in itself sounds rather vague uh, without going into further detail. Do you have like a, a matrix of values or sources of meaning, or do you have a process in mind on how we can uh, collectively reach those uh, sources of meaning? And just as a quick follow up question that uh, another doubt that came to uh, our minds here uh, how can we also prevent these? model of spaces to not become just another funnel, like just a bigger funnel that is funneling uh, spaces. Thank you. I'm not sure I understand the second part, but I'll, I'll go ahead and answer the first. Um, uh, so the, I have a database of about 4,000 of these sources of meaning, and um, uh, they're tagged by vaguer words that people often use as values. So. Um, there's uh, about 40 types of creativity in there. There's about 20 types of vulnerability. There's about 50 types of connection. Um, there's, uh, I don't know, maybe 15 types of integrity. Um, and these overlap. So something might be tabbed. It's might be, there might be a kind of creativity that's also a type of connection, <laughs> right? Several of them, right? So for instance, one kind of creativity that's also a type of connection would be uh, a creative jamming or creative riffing uh, when you're um, maybe like uh, uh, improving with people, for instance, or when you have a whiteboard and you're throwing ideas up on the whiteboard and it's really fun, right? So uh, all in all, there's like 4,000 of these uh, and they, but they, you, can, you can kind of navigate them by, by tag. Um, we also have an interview technique so that if you're talking to somebody about a meaningful experience that they've had, you can figure out pretty quickly what, and, and actually we, we have a new um, machine learning, uh, language, large language model way to do it. So now somebody just made a, um, a custom trained large language model that will take just a few sentences of a kind of meaning that you've experienced and find the values cards and be, show you four or five uh, sources of meaning from our database and say, hey, which is one of these uh, describe your, your meaningful experience well. So it gets productized, right? You, you get um, efficiency, I guess, um, effective means to, to get there. 
I understood uh, Santiago's second part of the question um, a little bit from a, a system theory uh, perspective. If you take Luhmann, right, whenever you <laughs> adopt the tax structure, the, the system will optimize to the new tax structure, uh, tax st structure. Similarly, now when we build spaces and we set up new um, metrics, right, everything will optimize to those metrics. And then is there not a, a pretty concrete uh, danger of falling into a tube trap or um, a funnel trap because you're funneling people into doing what they're supposed to do right in your space sure. and then uh, you're kind of mixing them i hope that was yeah so there's a there's a name for that gresham's law i think mm -hmm. um that metrics always get gamed um i think that uh this is always a danger, but if you have like better metrics, better auditing structures, better uh, survey methods, like uh, you know UXs that ask people to really introspect. If you operate on several levels, so you you know usually check using this survey, but occasionally you double check your survey by doing an in-depth, uh, you know, more anthropological investigation. There's lots of ways to fight Gresham's law. And if I may jump to your side on it, I think it already starts with um, conceiving of the technology space of the space that you have, not as something that is a fixed structure, but more like a, a living environment, right? Where obviously you constantly more like a gardener, right? You're checking that the um, plants are growing in the directions that you want. And of course you have to recalibrate and see when people are gaming the system. So uh, two questions in the room, please start with your name um, and then ask your question. So we have one more question in the chat. Should we- I'm worried that we're running out of time and these two uh, gentlemen have been waiting for a bit. Yeah, now. fair enough. Then we start <laughs> with Berlin first and go back to the online environment. Hello, my name is Oleg, and uh, uh, we are coming uh, in a new era, uh, age, uh, and Nokia already prom promised us uh, a body uh, mobile, mobile phones. Um, if we need a new age, a uh, new programming language, or uh, this what we have is enough? It's question on you too. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe let's get the second one in. So we, we have as many uh, contributions now. Hi, I'm Z. Uh, my question is kind of the opposite of what was asked previously. So is, for example, these monsters like Instagram, Tinder, Facebook, do you think it will ever be possible that they transition from a tunnel or a um, funnel into a space? And if not, do you think there is like a limit in terms of scale of a space? Mm. I'll answer the second one first. Um, no, there's not a limit. And I think that um, actually one of the only things that's holding large scale spaces back is the attention economy, like the, the, the war, the, the funnels that they're fighting. Um, I think that spaces can be, can be very big um, and can serve a lot of people, can serve billions of people. Um, Chances of existing um, superstars transitioning? Right. So uh, I have a lot of experience with this. So a team of like 16 people tried to make a version of Facebook newsfeed at Facebook that was more of a space. They took my class. Um, and they, um, so there were changes at Facebook actually because of my class um, and my, my talks. They changed newsfeed algorithm to be less addictive. Um, and there were changes at groups and events. Uh, that made them more space-like. Um, uh, badges and groups, there's a bunch of stuff in groups that's actually made them better as spaces. Um, but they could not do the newsfeed redesign. <laughs> um, this was something that couldn't ship within Facebook. Um, and uh, why is that? So, and I should say, some of the um, changes that were made were bad for Facebook's bottom line, um, but good for spaces. Um, uh, to some extent, these companies, because they're so big and powerful, they do have, and because they produce so much cash, they can actually turn that down a little bit. Um, and they can say, okay, we're going to make 4% less this quarter, but this is better for the users. They can do that. Um, but there's a limit to that, especially if it means losing to TikTok or 
one of their competitors, right? <laughs> so they can turn it down a little bit, but they can't, for a lot of reasons, they can't make a kind of radical redesign. Um, also because of their organizational structures, internal commitments, uh, newsfeed in, in particular is a super, super hard thing to change um, because it connects almost everything the company does. It connects ads, it connects events, it connects groups, right? And so a radical redesign of newsfeed is like, holy shit, how do we do that? Plus, if it means losing against their competitors, it really means losing, losing market share. So um, I'll I, jump to the next question. Sorry, to, oh yeah, sure. so we get more, more in and get yeah. a bit higher frequency. So it's, of course, a very speculative um, uh, question, Oleg. But um, what I can say is that I think in um, machine learning um, enabled systems, um, uh, things like setting values and you know desired outcomes become is a completely different thing than when you do that in a um, more traditional Newtonian um, deterministic program, right? Where it's much more difficult to include a fluffy concept like uh, optimizing for values and optimizing for spaces. I think that's a statement I'd be okay to do. Another thing I can say about programming languages is that. Uh, one of the reasons why it's really hard to design apps for meaning is because uh, social situations in real life are much more freely restructured. Like you, you can even change the way that a social system works. Like you can say, oh, like we're not listening to the introverts in the room. Like we should all spend, you know, those of us who are talking a lot should talk less. Right. And then you've just changed the rules. It's like you reprogram the social environment that you're in. Right. Um, uh, and you, you can't do that in an app. Like it's hard to do that in a chat room, right? Like, because there's no like sense that everybody has of how we're proceeding in the chat room, right? Um, but as uh, uh, end user programming evolves and as you can start to like, if you have, let's say you have a I don't know, Slack thread or a messenger thread, if, if you have a, some bots in there or you have some, if it's programmable and reprogrammable, then you could maybe, well, we'll I, I think probably in the next five, five six years, We'll be able to say, actually, I want to change how it works in this Slack channel. Um, I want to make a rule that uh, you know people can only speak every ten minutes or something like that, right? And then other people in the Slack channel can say, sure, rule adopted or whatever, and then the the, the thing will actually behave differently. And that, and I think there's a whole bunch of programming that can be done that way in this kind of group discussion kind of social social programming. This will be uh, will make things much easier. Ah, it gets me really inspired, right? Like web filtering would be another one where there's collective filters and um, mm. uh, you know what you see individually is not what uh, everybody sees. Jonas, please. Okay, so we're jumping back into uh, the online chat and Jan has raised his hand. Yep, um, finally. <laughs> um, so I, I have a, a whole bunch of questions that I'd like to ask, but I'll pick one that I uh, find most practically relevant for us as a school. Um, and then I'll probably be in touch uh, after this event, Joe, to ask all of the other questions. Because <laughs> you already caused uh, one or two sleepless nights for me during the awesome. last one or two weeks. Um, yeah, so so what I was wondering about, so let's assume that we're able to build a space uh, which actually addresses a, a, a bunch of sources of meaning that we that we intend to, to address. Um, what I feel, being a, a problem and i think you also addressed that in your in your talk uh, how do we actually get the people to prefer spaces over tubes and funnels because usually people like the way that we have experienced the last 10 20 30 whatever years uh we are more prone towards instant gratification right that's what we want and even though we know that another option might be better for the long term we're not choosing it and i feel the same also sometimes in our school if we try to create a space then people might not use that opportunity or, or see that opportunity uh, because they're just used to funnels and tubes. So how do we actually get people to uh, to use this space and to, yeah, and 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 also what's a good business model that can work for it? Because I, I uh, tend to struggle with that. Mm. Yeah, I don't have short answers to either of those questions, um, but I do have a big community of people that struggle with those questions and sometimes solve them for their particular instances that I'd love to connect you with. Um, so 
uh, I think broadly the answer to the first one is some kind of education of the consumer or whatever the user like you, you need to just like organic or bio had to you need to be like listen you might think you want x but coming back to the zeitgeist right now it's a much more fertile ground for the, yeah. those arguments that you had 10 years ago yeah and i can tell you that a lot of people do succeed in that like they do actually make a connection with the user and then you know with the potential user the when they're when in, as part of their i guess sales process or marketing they manage to communicate this and it works out Uh, but I do think it's an extra hurdle. Uh, it's one of the reasons why it's harder to make a space. And uh, business model, same. You often need to do kind of more complicated things in your business model. Like for instance, the even.com company that I talked about, if they made their money by selling interest on loans, they would want to turn into a funnel. Um, so instead, they work with people's employers where they, the employers want uh, their employees to be stable financially. Ooh. And the employers pay for the, uh, you know, right? So this is, this is the kind of stuff that you have to figure out if you're trying to monetize a space. You have to find out, okay, like what's a business model that won't make the incentives wrong? And it's hard. And it, I don't have a cookie cutter solution for everyone, but I, I do have maybe a hundred different solutions that have worked for different people. I thought that last example was was really good. At least for me, it made like okay, you know, it's it's just it's a different business. It's um, actually you're taking something like handing out loans, and you're rethinking it uh, how it, you know, several stakeholders can benefit, yeah. and uh, and it's a, a reasonable and meaningful uh, engagement. Very cool. Well, unfortunately, um, as uh, expected, the hour flew by. I hope um, you learned a thing or two and you got interested to learn more. Um, I, as I said, would love to um, make you a regular here in the school. Um, we have a fellowship program to engage with experts from uh, all walks of life. And uh, maybe that's an interesting path for us. Um, If you have any more questions, um, as Joe said, there is a whole community. It's, a, it's an open source project in a way, an open educational resource and a, and a um, venture of um, intellectual innovation um, next to the tech innovation that results from that. Thank you so much for coming over and joining us today. Uh, thanks for your interest and thanks for everybody who joined us online. Let's do this again soon. Um, feel invited to recommend uh, guests or um, how we might improve this whole setup. Uh, it's a peer learning effort. And um, with that, Jonas, any last words of, uh, from the man for the ceremony? No last words from my side. Thanks all for tuning in. Cool. That, that was almost like a, a no, nothing went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a live demo yeah. in a way. Like you, you only